Hey, mi gente. I'm so happy to be here tonight with everybody. I'm Alicia Inez Guzman, and I'm honored to be here with Gia, who is one of my favorite essayists. And I'm also honored to be here uh, in Santa Fe, also known as Ogapoge Awenge, White Shell Water Place and ancestral lands of our Tewa relatives. So I welcome everybody, guests and uh, um, newcomers and Gia to this conversation to Santa Fe. And I'm just, I think this is just such an affirmation right now seeing everybody in the audience of community, but also hopefully the power of the pen. So with that, we'll just get started. So my first question with Gia uh, today is really about what the role of the writer is. And so Gia, you mentioned in Trick Mirror about the unlimited supply of bad information <laughs> in the world, right? We have, dare I say, fake news and, um, you know, dubious reporting. Um, you know, we have social media, which, you know, is like a trick mirror. Um, so what is the role of the writer right now amidst all of these, um, you know, potentially delusional <laughs> spaces? Well, I'm excited to ask this question back to you in a second. And I want to say, um, I'm so glad to be here with you, Alicia. And I, this is my first time in Santa Fe ever. Um, brought my toddler and my three-month-old, thanks to Side Santa Fe's lovely hospitality. So I'm really, really thrilled to be here in this beautiful space with, with all of you. Um, I think, right, so, you know, there's one answer to what the role of a writer is that has something to do with just pure expression, right? But I think we all know that a world in which everyone is as free as possible to express themselves as many times a day as possible has not exactly led to, it's, it's led to like utter, um, utter civic breakdown and a lack of agreement on what constitutes truth. So, so like, I, I, I want to say that I, you know, as much as writing for me, and I, I, I'm sure for you, is an essential practice of self-interrogation and interrogating our surroundings. And, you know, there, that I, you know, I don't have Pollyanna-ish views on the value of, you know, everyone, but of, of myself saying what's on my mind. Like, I, I think we have plenty of evidence around us to suggest that the answer has to be finer than that and more complicated than that. I think um, when we were talking about this earlier, I thought through what I, how I would answer this as a reader, right? What I think the role of a writer is as someone that relies on other people's writing to clarify the world. And one thing that's been on my mind lately, I mean, I do think, I was, I was interviewing a, a Filipina journalist named um, Patricia Evangelista, who just wrote this incredible book, Some People Need Killing, about the Duterte, um, you know, so-called drug war. And, and she, you know, she has, we were speaking last week and she was saying, you know, I don't have any illusions that this will change the world, that me exposing, you know, these extrajudicial killings will change the practice. But she said, you know, all I can hope for is that this is a record that will stand in time, right? Like, I, and I've been thinking about that, you know, in Gaza as journalist after journalist gets killed, like it's the, I think what I do believe about the role of a writer at its most, at the most fundamental is to record something that otherwise might be overwritten by those with more power than you, um, to just simply bear witness and hope that that in itself, that that in itself will capture a reality that um, will, you know, will hold like a rock in the river of, you know, of the, like a, a steady rock in the river of discourse and chaos and misinformation and whatever, and and that, and then internally, I think, that means that the role of a writer is if all you're doing is rendering what you are seeing very clearly, then our own role as a writer is to do that with as much generosity as possible, with as much sharpness as possible, with as much self-interrogation and um, external interrogation as possible, um, to do it as honestly as one can. But what, do you, what, do you, what is it for you? <laughs> Well, I, th I think it's I think it's similar. Um, you know, a lot of what I do is so hyper local, and a lot of what I've learned comes from community here. You know, I came out of school and thinking, okay, I've read all of these like French theorists, but like my teachers have been my community members. You know, and um, indigenous women and my family and. 
um, you know, just people who are doing work on the ground, artists, creatives, um, like critical thinkers, people who are willing to be honest. And, um, and so I think for me, what I've learned while being here and being kind of thinking about this hyper-local um, landscape in New Mexico is really about like colonization and how colonization teaches you to forget um, and that's, you know, the fundamental mechanism is amnesia. And so for me, what decolonizing means is remembering. And so that's kind of what I'm hoping to do is remember in all the ways possible how we were taught to forget who we are, what this place is, um, who our relatives are here. Um, and so that, you know, in the long arc of time, you know, remembering means something in the present and it will mean something in the future as well and I think that applies to when I'm thinking about nuclear issues because nuclear issues aren't new to this place by any stretch of the ima imagination it's just another chapter of colonization for me and so uh, my job the way that I see it is to remember and to hopefully as you said to be very generous and to think about self-representation in that process and like you said I think just constantly interrogating your own like perspective right and what that means yeah I think also you know there's what, what you were saying earlier I think that about how you know you, you come out of maybe you come out of the academy reading stuff from elsewhere and then you write about stuff from here and I think that there's there's something about the process that, you know, that, okay, well, I'll, I'll just say, I think that, I think that writing can serve the purpose of, I think with me personally, I often feel that I'm trying to write myself into the person that I wish I was. In everyday life, I feel pretty dumb. <laughs> I feel, you know, I feel, I feel incredibly confused all the time. I feel incredibly bewildered um i feel i feel anything but clear i i feel often lost and you know and yeah and but through writing you, you i think one purpose of writing is that you can you can kind of write something into being you can write like through writing i can see what it would look like on the page if i was if every day in real life, I pushed myself to be as honest as possible and as generous as possible and to think deeply and historically and to, and to you know, th there's that formulation that attention is a form of prayer or a form of love. And I think that that's one of the practices that writing serves. It's, um, it's that you can, you, can, you can bring into focus the reality around you and what it could be and as well as what you yourself could be if I was like I I was talking to like George Saunders also talks about this like he you know that in in his real life and in, in my real life too I'm quick to judgment right like I'm quick to saying this view is the good one this view is the bad one and but it's through writing and from his point of view it was through fiction writing through forcing himself to inhabit the interior perspective of a character with perhaps different politics than himself different life that you you get to the thing that feels like one of the purposes of being human, which is learning to see more clearly through your own eyes and through others, too. I'm so confused all the time, and I'm so glad we can talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think, like, um, I think being able to clarify through writing is something that's really important because there's, some, there's like, a... it's you know, it's radical and it's not radical in the sense that like you have to be really empathetic in that sense to, to be able to clarify and clarify and ask questions and, and try and arrive at something, right? It's toil. I mean, it's downright painful sometimes, like FYI. <laughs> I love the pain though. <laughs> yeah, we too. <laughs> I love the pain. I don't like, um, I, do, I don't, I don't feel satisfied. Like I realized after my book came out that I, I you know, 
I think there are some people that write to have written and I was like, oh no, I hate having written. I'd rather just be sitting in agony in front of a screen because because that's where you feel the change. Like that's Same. where you feel the alchemical practice yeah. happen. That's where you feel your that's where you feel that it is possible through an enormous amount of effort to be better than you currently are. And I think that's, you know, that's a reminder that writing gives me that I find kind of spiritually important that that through focused attention, you can transcend your current limits and you might snap back to them the next day. But in doing that, you know, you, you were saying, um, back to what you are originally saying, I think that as a reader, I think one of the functions that, that writing serves for me is simply to make me feel less alone, mm -hmm. to realize that there are other people that can clarify and you know, that they, they can clarify the mush that's in my own brain. And then maybe sometimes my work will be able to clarify the mush that's in someone else's brain. And then it'll be a cycle like that on and on and on for the rest of our lives. <laughs> yes, I agree. I'm totally on board with what you're saying. <laughs> Which makes me think about, you know, me reading your book, me being a reader and, um, you know, reading the chapter on literary heroines and following you as you're writing this chapter and you start off kind of in the genre and there's like Little House on the Prairie and all of these um, characters that, that you're, you know, we're supposed to identify with. And so that actually was an interesting process of helping me clarify the mush in my brain about what it meant to be a reader, like a young, um, Chicana reader reading like Laura Inger Ingalls Wilder and wondering like what does this have to do with me but not till later when I was like this is right, really because, problematic <laughs> but when you read it the first time did it did you think I mean did, did you think like I, I read it the first time and I was like look she is me like I I am Laura right like I am this headstrong girl that gets into huge messes all the time and like wants to like make her own money to support her family and wants to, you know, gets mad at her shitty teacher and like rocks the, you know, rocks the bench at school till she gets kicked out. Like I, I read it and I was like, she, she is me and she, she's adventurous. And this is, this is what living is. Like, did you have? Yeah, totally. I wasn't like, this is totally problematic. You were like, until pause, later. pause in blackface. <laughs> exactly. Later on you realize Pa is actually in blackface for yeah, a good amount exactly. of one of those books. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Didn't realize that at all. It's like, it's like, it's you the know. part where they have like a, like a, like a, um, uh, there's like a variety show, you know, and yeah, I'm seeing some nods. Like we all know that part, right? It's like crazy. <laughs> yeah. We all kind of like repressed it yeah. the way that like, you know, just the way that that narrative works yeah. because it's like focused on her, but you're right. Like I was like, Oh cool. Like a young girl. I was, I don't know, maybe 10. I'm still grateful for, so I, I wrote this this essay in my book, I wrote it because at one point, you know, I guess as I was a, approaching or in adulthood, it seemed to me that the literary trajectory for the classic heroines that we all grew up with, right, They're, you know, the the girl ones, it's, it's Laura, you know, Laura Ingalls Wilder from Little House on the Prairie, and it's Harriet the Spy, and it's um, Claudia from from the Mixed Up Files, which I bet there are a lot of you know lovers of in this room, and um, you know who else? Like these Nancy Drew, these adventurers, right? And then and then you get into adolescence, and it becomes like the Bell Jar and Twilight, you know, like like girls who are extremely you, you go from you go from bold and adventurous and messy and you know, and, and and full of a spark to, you know, suddenly they, they become adolescents and become desired and they become desirable and they become extremely depressed and and they become featureless sort of vessels of other people's desire. And then you get into adulthood and it's Madame Bovary and Anna Karenina and they fall in love, get married, and then they kill themselves, you know? And I was like, what does it, like, what what is up with this? What you know? gives? What, you know, and, and it was, it just seems, you know, and it, I'm, I know I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but not really. <laughs> you know, it's it's not rare are the exceptions to this within the within the canon. And so when I was writing this essay, I went back and reread all of you know all of these books, Middlemarch, which is kind of one of the exceptions, like you know all the way. And I was like, why is it that you would go from brave to depressed to dead, married and then dead? Why? And what does that mean? <laughs> like, what what does that mean about how these 
how this lineage is functioning in our brains. What are they telling us about what it means to be a woman? And then, you know, very early on in this reading journey, and an, you know, a, a crucial feature is that we are taught when when you think literary heroine, the entire lineage of women are white, and that's, and then of, of course there are massively important literary heroines who are not, but they're often you know, those books are often taught even in school as this is not emblematic of, you know, womanhood. This is emblematic of black womanhood, of, of Chinese womanhood, right? Like that's, the default is this really, really narrow narrative. And I thought that that was worth rereading them all to see, um, you know, how they were functioning. And I think, you know, one of the I think one of the ways that the the part that really troubled me as I was thinking about let's say starting a family right I was like like is there a way out of this is there a way out of the part where your person gets erased and you're incredibly depressed and then you just think about death all the time you know and and I think you know these I think that there I think that there's an answer being one of the answers that I found was in let's say the the Neapolitan books, the Ferrante books, which I think, you know, I, I make the argument in this essay that this is one of the first times that there has been a work of, that there's been a major work of fiction about women's domestic lives that has been received as emblematic of the human condition rather than the feminine condition. There's a, you know, there's a famous formulation by Simone de Beauvoir that she says, you know, men, literature about men, all of, you know, <laughs> White Fang, Great Gatsby, right? Like, you know, the, the kid stuff all the way through, you know, Dostoevsky, it's, it, that always has been taken as emblematic of the human condition. And those men, many of them are married, but what they do in the books is go outside and transcend, right? And, and I was working through my own desire to be like, I wanna be the one that, that, that transcends. I don't, is there a way to live within the domestic while having that inform the universal and inform what your definition of um, self-determination and transcendence is. And I think that, you know, one of the conclusions that I found was that the, I think the, you know, the Ferrante novels do do that. Like it's, um, but I think, um, I think that what the trajectory that ends in jumping in front of a train was doing for a long time was warning was warning readers, contemporaneous readers, that this is what this institution will do to you if you let it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I still found that a useful warning. I, I still found that um, to be a useful warning about the, like the about conventional domesticity, which is still often defined as white, you know, aspirational domesticity. That that's what that will do to you if you let it. And and I think and I think what I had to do for myself is you know, think about, think about the other lineages. I was like, okay, now I have, now I understand what this, this canon, this particular canon, what it was, what it was teaching me and what I can take from it and what I can learn um, about what can be transcended and what can't. And, and then, you know, and then, and then for me on my, part of that journey was recognizing the, the trajectories and traditions that run alongside it where motherhood and community play an enriching role and an, a vivifying role rather than um, a role that you know separates yourself from yourself. And many of those were written by women of color. Exactly. I think that's the thing is that when you get kind of this lineage of novels in which they're Western and white and they're posed as universal then you start to think that that's possibly the only narrative there is. And I distinctly remember being in high school and reading uh, and discovering that there were indigenous writers and that there were Latin American writers and that there were black writers and that the version of womanhood that they depicted for me was actually closer to what like I hoped for. Yeah, it was, it was like this, is, it, I just remember reading like I Isabel Allende and like House of Spirits and feeling like this is this is me. Well, I think there's also something, I mean, this is something that I think about all the time, which is I think one, you know, the 
the the vision of contemporary life that is the most heavily sort of supported by industry and finance and sort of dominant i like dominant material structures is one in which you you grow up and you form a nuclear domestic unit and then you protect that unit and that's and that's and and you you fortify a tower around yourself and your own and you make that space inside it as beautiful and as peaceful and as safe and you give the people within that unit as much flourishing as they possibly can and that you know i mean that's really what has been traditionally presented as the american dream and 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 a certain vision of what motherhood is and a certain vision of what just like successful adulthood is it's a version of life that is and i think that this is also the vision of life that's supported by um you know everything about the contemporary internet everything about social media it necessarily positions the individual self at the center of the world and i think the you know the sum effect of like so the sum effect of that is you know a, a life that is as isolated and convenient and um optimized as possible right where i think that you know this is another thing i wrote about in my book but it's like i think that living that vision of a life it 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 leads people into tremendous loneliness and it's the messier it it and it also like utterly forsakes the reality of our interdependence the fundamental reality of our interdependence at like a pure biological level as we were all reminded of with covid in 2020 and you know for many things before and since and just that we you know to pretend towards like an aspirational beautiful fortress of individual family life um you know, i think it's civically destructive i think it's you know emotionally destructive and you know no matter where you are no matter what gender you are no matter where you fit in that equation um and i think yeah i think that was you know when i was thinking about those books and the that particular tradition i have found myself then and since much more hungry for work that will lead me for work for anything for politics for community organizations that kind of place the reality of interdependence at the forefront of um of what it is to be alive. Absolutely. Yeah, the question of community and how you build community, you know, in this kind of like isolation and connectivity. Yeah, and we're and you know, there's like um and you know, I've I've felt this in a particular way as I mentioned like I have two very small children and um you know, people are always bemoaning the fact that there's not, you know, we're we're taught to there's not like a village anymore, right? That we're that children were meant to be raised by a lot of people in a community and now it's mostly just like struggle struggle on your own with whatever help mm -hmm. you can pay for, right? And I think that, you know, one of the ways that I've found myself talking to even my friends about it is like, you know, you it's it's scary to, you know, a lot of people like I don't like asking for help, right? Like I think that's like something that you know, no one likes asking for help, but that's part of, it, it's, it, it has reminded me of how that acknowledgement of interdependence is so kind of absent from, from life, where we are, where the, the mutuality of it is scary, where if you rely on someone else, you're going to have to let them rely on you. And to, and to like enter in a life that is truly full of interdependence means a lot of risk. It means, it means, that you will have to inconvenience yourself for a lot of other people and that only in return will you get, you know, a life where other people will inconvenience themselves for you. <laughs> and maybe they're going to make you laugh. Yeah. And like do all sorts of things. Oh yeah. yeah. Right. Well, right. You know? And all of the good things that comes as a matter <laughs> of fact, but, um, but, but yeah, I think that there is like, there is just so much of a current of just like, let's it, the easy way to do it is just the the lonely and expensive way and um you know and i and i think and, and i think there's a way in which that's true and but the the mess the mess of reliance on other people is um i don't know there's a long way from that heroine's essay but that um but that's where that one vision of like what aspirational womanhood would look like sent me just straight in the other direction so let me ask you a biographical question. So when I read a lot of your essays and a lot of the book, there is mention of your journal. And so if you read anything that Gia's written, uh, there are kind of references to journaling and to young Gia 
and like young Gia's thoughts. And I thought that was so kind of incredible because in a way you are your own source. You know, you, your former self is like your own source. And it made me think of um, one of my favorite quotes of all time, uh, Toni Morrison. You know, she was writing this essay about writing itself. And she talked about the subject of the dream is the dreamer. And so I was thinking about that as I was reading, you know, as I read your work where I like tumble upon a journal entry or something like that. And I just wanted to ask you about that process of including yourself in writing, which is necessarily part of what it means to be an essayist, I think. So I was just yesterday reading a book that had that quote in it. That's so funny. Oh, really? Yeah, the new Melissa Broder one. I um I think, so I've always kept a journal in part because of what I was saying earlier, that writing for me serves a very particular function. There's, like Joan Didion wrote about it. I'm gonna butcher the quote, but it was like, I, 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 have, I have no access to my own mind unless I'm writing. And that's exactly how I feel. <laughs> like I, I have no idea what's going on in there unless I write. I can only feel kind of an opaque cloud of something's bothering me or something is interesting me. And then once I start writing, it becomes, a, you know, it's like, I'm making a path for myself to follow. But I, until I write, I have no idea what's happening. And so for all my life, keeping a journal has just served as a function of keeping my head from flying to pieces. You know, it's, um, it's the only way that I can figure out how I'm feeling about whatever is happening and whatever. And it, it was kind of just keeping a record. Like I, uh, but so the reason why I, this book in particular, it was like, I wrote it when there were, let's say, there were like, I think there are nine essays in the book. For me in my mind, there were nine questions that had been building in my mind that I had become interested in, usually because of some particular experience, but that interested me as sort of larger systemic questions. Like why is America so obsessed with optimization? And you know, what, uh, you know, various questions like that. Um, and one of the, the, the essay in here that most relies on my own writing was I grew up within a really, really conservative Southern Baptist community in Houston, Texas. And, you know, at some point I was trying to figure out the role of ecstasy in my life where it's, you know, in a religious format, in the format of drug experiences, you know, what it was about me that had been formed by, you know, this kind of mystical reaching, whatever. And, but so I found that, I found that, um, I, as I was saying to you earlier, it's just, I don't even, I don't trust, I don't trust my own, I don't trust my own memory, right? Like I, I work at the New Yorker, the fact checkers there are sort of legendarily, you know, like if you say that the sky was blue, they will look up the weather at those GPS coordinates and they will say like, actually it was partly cloudy, you know? And, 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 in, and in that, you know, this process of being just raked over, which I consider a great, great honor um, to have my memory checked, I have realized you know, every time I publish a piece there, I realize, you know, I think I'm a good observer, but sometimes I will, you know, be sitting across from someone I'm interviewing and I'll write down what color boots they're wearing and maybe I wouldn't have written down white, maybe I wrote down gray. And so the closer I can get to a contemporaneous account of what's happening, like I felt like I couldn't write about anything, any strongly, any experience that had molded me without going back to the closest thing to a primary source that I had, which was my journal. And, and then I realized, you know, at some point, it was like, this is a way that personally, another way that personally writing has functioned, which was that I was little and being like, I'm writing this down. I'm confused about something. Mm. I'm trying to figure it out now. Maybe later on, I'll be able to figure it out better with the help of you know this mess that I have right here. And it has worked. And, um, and so maybe in 10 years, I'll look back at what I've written in my journal about right now and I'll, fig I'll, I'll figure it out. <laughs> Yeah, I think that just, you know, it's it's interesting to see kind of it pop up in a lot of different essays that you write. And it's like, oh, I get Gia now and I get Gia then. And I get to see kind of the confluence of different selves, you know. I think it's also about admitting culpability. You know, I think I also mistrust, um, you know, part of what writing is, it's, it's, it's creating a, a narrative that is mm -hmm. clear and convincing. And that's a quality that I think is deeply important and also to be, it's deeply suspect, right? Mm -hmm. 
Like we can create a clear and convincing narrative out of a, a lot of terrible, terrible things that will convince, you know? And, um, and so I mistrust th this faculty within, within, you know, the writer's brain, within my own brain, even as I know that that's the primary function of what I'm doing. And so I think um, in some cases, I was trying to use it to acknowledge like, you know, this, the morality of the situation seems quite clear to me now, but when I was in it, it didn't then. Mm -hmm. when, it, when, when I was in it, when I was 14, I, was a tr I, I wanted the wrong, I wanted the exact wrong thing. I, 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 you know, I cleaved to a structure that I now find destructive. And I want, and part of that was, like I think that's part of what, you know, political development, what artistic development, spiritual development is, it's realizing, um, you know, it's, it's acknowledging and it's it's kind of per, a, a perpetual reevaluation and willingness to change, right? It's the willingness to say, I had that wrong five years ago, one year ago, three days ago, and be willing to like put that down and be willing to to say I'm I'm somewhere different. And there's something about that act of keeping a record of my own wrongness that I also find useful for for this, pro this project of being alive, which is also a project of writing. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think just like seeing your point of view change over time is really interesting. You know, the fact that we can change and have a different perspective. I don't think that we allow ourselves that to think that like, that, you know, the world could change us. But, you know, we were talking earlier about how criticism is an act of love. And I think in this case, it's the same. It's like when we're, talking about the world and when I'm talking about community and like, you know, nuclear weapons, it's from a place of love. It's from a place of like, I want my community to be better. But like, and I think maybe, I don't know if that's true for you when you're thinking about this aspect of writing um, and like change, being able to change perspectives and like, you know, it's an incredible act of self-interrogation, but also like, I think love and generosity. Yeah, and I think often about there's this um, the you know the the Keatsian concept of negative capability, which is that you know whatever it is that we're whatever it is that we are capable of, we we can't see it yet. You know that that whatever it is that we are striving for is not currently within our grasp. And and again, it's like one of the ways in which the pro the project of writing feels like the project of being a person is acknowledging that you know this this version of ourselves that can transcend reality, that can change the parts of reality that we wish to change, we don't, you know, we haven't seen it yet. We haven't seen that better version of ourselves yet. We can only continually fumble, fumble our way towards it. Um, and that's, and that's a practice that, yeah, keeping that record of that fumbling um, has helped me do. Um, you know, I think that, that also, like what this conversation is, you know, leading us toward, and something that I've been thinking about in your work um, is this question of consent um, and what it means to be a writer, uh, thinking about consent, and also thinking about uh, women and consent and body politics. And that's something that's kind of threaded its way through your work that I think that is immensely personal to you but also on a in a global way relevant to a lot of different people everywhere right and so you've written a lot about Roe v. Wade um, you know one of my favorite essays is about Ozempic <laughs> um, it's a really good essay um, and so I just wanted to ask you about this you know how that functions you know you have this great quote when David Remnick is interviewing you about uh, Ozempic, you know, um, the the extremely complicated landscape of body politics. And so I just wanted to ask you about how that, you know, interweaves itself into your work and into your thinking. Well, I think, you know, we all, like, you hear the word consent and you think, like, traditionally you think, like, sexual consent in and around a specific act. But to me, I, I think the way that I think about it more often is... The kind of the the broader, you know, I know this is something that you have thought about and written about a lot, you know, with your, you know, your life, your family's life in and around Los Alamos, right? That um, that I I think that the way that I think about consent now is is what it is that we are not 
given a chance to collectively consent to the the things that we the things that our our lives put us in in agreement with just without us ever having wanted that or ever having agreed at all you know and we can think about that in terms of things that our government's doing things that our government is supporting things that you know you think about um like even things I've found writing about abortion, also shout out to New Mexico on, on, on the reproductive rights front. I mean, truly, and the, repro and the religious coalition for reproductive rights. I mean, truly, thank God. But um, <laughs> really, <laughs> um, I, will, I wrote an essay called Is Abortion Sacred? Because I, I mean, as with this incredible New Mexican organization, I mean, um, I, think that, I think that the work supporting that life or death choice is truly, truly feels sacred to me. Um, as someone that grew up in an extremely traditional church, but, but I I, I found with writing about, um, you know, th this idea that it it should be a choice, you know, that motherhood should be a choice. Sure, that that is absolutely true. But then, but but behind that, there are so many more layers of, you know, that there are so many paradigms behind that idea that like motherhood is the the most, you know, the the sort of ultimate form of womanhood that 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 people should ascend to. Nobody consented to that, you know. Nobody like that. Th that's a, that's an idea that that everyone in this room has 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 lived with and been shaped by in one way or another. That that the role of an adult woman is to have children, and none of none of us consented to that. And that like that was that was manufactured for us and and enforced for us in you know in, in public policy and birth control availability and in the deepest reaches of us, which is the desire that everyone has to love someone. Like I think that was one of the most um heartbreaking things to me in in covering the reproductive rights rollback, you know, of the last 13 years since the Texas State House started chopping away at things is that um, is that the this kind of manufactured consent towards motherhood is one of the things it hinges on is the best things about people, which is their desire to to care and be good and the way that that has gotten weaponized really against women. I um, I think, yeah, I don't know. How do you think about it vis-a-vis -vis the stuff that you've you've written about with Los Alamos? Yeah, I mean, I think about it. I think about it similarly. You know, I think what I've learned again from community is that you know, violence against women is violence against the environment, and that's something that's been kind of taught to me and, and drilled into me, and and influences the way I think about how Los Alamos works. You know, as a laboratory and how it arrived here in secrecy and how there was really no chance to say yes or no, we want that to be here, and how retroactively we have to deal with that. And what we end up with instead is kind of a, a lopsided social contract that, you know, basically you you say, okay, well, we're here, we provide good jobs, and we, you know, the lab can create kind of an economic bourgeoisie and an upper crust, and, and those, you know, people can better themselves, but, you know, what is the, um, what are the repercussions for people that don't get to choose that path for themselves and that um, in community, right? And so I think that that's something, the way that I think about consent is that yes, you know, there, the lab has enacted a form of violence, but just as in, you know, a bad relationship, you retroactively question yourself and say well it could be okay maybe it will be okay um I get some kind of benefit from it maybe I'm safe for a little while like all of these ways in which like women kind of question themselves I think is the way and and get gaslit right. you know I think that's maybe what I'm getting at is is the way that that I feel about Los Alamos National Laboratory and how that it how we exist here in relation to that kind of state-sanctioned violence. Well, there's a, there's a way in which adaptation can masquerade as assent and consent, right? That, that adaptation and even optimism, right? Another like beautiful, deeply human, like necessary, like, you know, spiritual quality that inheres in, in us like that. Um, and I think about, and, and also again, I think 
it's it's part of what you're talking about. Um, I often think. I often think that the desire to take good care of the people that we love, like again, that sort of, like here is my circle and I'm gonna do my best to protect it, that that is the place where, you know, the, the ugliest reaches of capitalism, the, the greatest, greatest bone grinding exploitation from, you know, on the side of the exploited and on the side of the exploiter and, and all of the many, 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 many levels in between in which we all find ourselves. Um, and the combinations of the two in which we all find ourselves, everyone, everyone in this spectrum is thinking, I want to protect and take care of the people I love. And that's what hooks us all into, you know, me like these material structures that are, are destructive to the environment, destructive to our souls, destructive to, you know, the, the kind of large scale human flourishing. Um, but I think about the way that the thing that connects us all to them is, is is a is the beautiful human quality of wanting to love and take care of the, you know, the people around us, and 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 there's no there's and that's why these structures are so intractable, right? And I I think there's something like interesting about that because um, it's like security all the way down for what you're talking about, right? right? It's like different ideas of security, exactly, and and the like willingness that the an individual is, you know, the great length somebody will go to concede to a, a project like working for something that's really terrible on the whole for your community, but that can be really beneficial for you as an individual. And I think that this, you know, it shows up in your book and all of these other different places, you know, like uh, when you talk about uh, scammer culture and like, you know, Amazon and, you know, families and, you know, like where how you have to navigate the system and kind of like uh, late capitalism and the marketplace, right? Because you are shaped by it and you are subject of and to that system. So how do you have agency in a system like that? And I think that's like ultimately like the question that I think about. Right, I think, I mean, the, the flip side of the question of, you know, how you think about dissent is like, where is there space for dissent? And what mm -hmm. does that look like and what, what muscle can it have? You know, when, when there's an absence, I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, like it's like when there is an absence of meaningful consent, what can meaningful dissent look like? Mm -hmm. And where can it have teeth that that consent did not? And um, yeah, and I think about that, you know, I've been like on this shameful, like I, you know, I've been a, an Amazon boycotter for so long and then I had a newborn, and I and I said I was like I'm on Rumspringa, you know, <laughs> like it's like I'll use this for 40 days and then just get get in, get out, get on with my life, you know. But because I was doing the thing where I was like, oh, but I really need it, you know. And I was always like, you know, I'm an able-bodied person that makes good money that lives in New York. Like I can walk. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not going to use this service where the drivers pee in bottles and you know warehouse workers wear trackers on every inch of their body that like prods them when they're not going fast enough, you know. Or like famously, they lined up ambulances outside of one warehouse to. Just because it was cheaper to take people out as they were fainting than to turn on the AC, right? Like it's like I, you know, and and but almost everyone in America uses, you know, and it's and it, and for a while I was like I'm taking, like I'm saying no, you know, and and then I and then you know three months ago I had my rum springa and I'm crawling my way out in a in a form of dissent that individually means nothing, right? It doesn't mean anything that I, one person, am not using this service. But then, in another way, it does, <laughs> right? Then, in another way, like, I, I do think that these small forms of dissent of, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, been going to demonstrations lately, and I'm like, what does this mean? What is this doing? You know, this is not, this is not going to make my rep call for a ceasefire. But, but, but I think I still believe in these small actions of dissent. I think they are so, because they, they do accumulate just as all of the small things that led towards some, you know, a manufactured consent add up. That, like, I, I have to believe, part of it is also just modeling for yourself that dissent is possible, mm -hmm. right? And um, maybe for the next, the person sitting next to you, the, you, you know, the friend that's asking about what you did that day. Like, I have to believe, I, I at a time when I'm thinking, like, what, where can there be meaningful dissent right now in places where it's needed? And I don't know what it looks like other than things that often feel useless to me in the, you know, in the in the everyday instance. But then you hope that in the accumulation, something will result. Absolutely. I mean, I think about it every time I go to Whole Foods. 
And I'm like so aggro yeah. for so many reasons. The parking lot's insane. Yeah, it's, I know. <laughs> and then Wait, the parking lot is okay. Yeah, because my did you go? Well, yeah, because it's, it's really close to my Whole Foods. It's really it's like close to my Airbnb, and I was like, I have to get milk for my for for Paloma, my three year old. And she had a meltdown in the parking lot. Like she was she was literally like she was going, "Mommy, I wish you would just drive. I wish you would just drive." And, and that's then me. I heard, and then I was texting that's my, me. And then I was texting my friends. They were like, "That parking lot is." <laughs> And I was like, what is the deal with this parking lot? I am the toddler yeah, yeah, yeah. in the parking lot. <laughs> no, it's insane. It's a terrible parking lot. Uh, I think everybody's aggro. But anyway, uh, it was like that before Amazon probably got worse after Amazon when they started selling a lot of stuffed animals at Whole Foods. Um, <laughs> but I was thinking about like these small acts of dissent and what that means. and And I was, you know, it was thinking about how like, you know, as writers, there's something, maybe the writing now isn't gonna hit, but as a historical record, there is something that will be, that is aspirational and maybe in the future, we can look back on that kind of act of dissent, you know, cumulatively in the historical record as like speaking the truth in public. Right. And so much of, you know, I think so much of life is is like, yeah, I don't like the way that works, but that is the way it is. You know, like like there's a way in which that kind of feels like the default setting in, in contemporary American life. Like, um, I don't like it, but it is what it is. And and I think, you know, absent of immediate ways to upend and radically, you know, radically change these things, finding places where you can and do say no. Um, like, yeah, that, that feels increasingly, increasingly on my mind. I love saying no, but I didn't used to. I think, I think that's something that's really interesting is when you learn to say no, especially as women and like you exercise that power to say no, because like the world teaches you to bend over backwards to do all sorts of things that again comes back to consent. Right. And like, you're like, okay, I'll do that. And then you're like, oh, I feel really weird about saying that. You know? <laughs> like, oh yeah, no, my um I think my my kids um pre-K teacher, you know, I was we had our first conference and I was like, oh my god, I'm having conferences about a three-year-old already, you know. And I was like, she's you know, she's getting incredibly defiant these days, as you know, three-year-olds are are wont to. And the teacher said, she she just simply was like, That's that's good, actually. You know, that's that's good. And it was and it was really nice to just remember that, right? That I um, I was like, yeah, she's not obedient at all, you know? And the teacher was like, no, we want that. We want, we actually want that as a quality that we nurture and just hopefully sand the edges off of. And, <laughs> you know, and, and I was, and, and, and that was a reminder that, yeah, I like, um, I believe in this, I believe in this value and I guess I got to believe in it for my <laughs> little toddler too. <laughs> I mean, I would love to go back to my toddler self because I was like, had a major attitude problem. <laughs> <laughs> that it's socialized out of and so I'm like constantly trying to go back to toddler version of Alicia where I was like no my parents know this story where I told them I didn't want to eat beancitos aka beans and so this is the story of like no for me but I want to go back to that version of me you know like the unsocialized version which I think is like totally beautiful and I mean I think you know looking forward what for you maybe is the kind of like ethics of being a writer especially right now I know we've talked a little bit about it but like even in your um book and the essay on uh going to the University of Virginia and like being a reporter and looking back on that like, what does it mean to be kind of an ethical reporter looking back and asking questions and um, asking questions of, you know, the story itself. And maybe you can explain a little bit about that um, as a journalist, as, as an essayist. Yeah, so I went to, um, I w went to undergrad at the University of Virginia, which has, which was founded by Thomas Jefferson, as a very extreme sort of Thomas Jefferson, Monticello, like fetish really to, you know, there's there's no other word for it. You, like everyone, everyone called him Mr. Jefferson as if he was walking around among us. It was, it was, it was wild. And, and I, and I remember like actually- Like to who though? Like the, to anyone, like he was a major topic. You know, I mean, well, every, like, every place- To has the its, wind? 
like just like Mr. Jefferson, like, like, yeah, or like this is like what like Mr. Jefferson would have wanted. You know, like there's every place oh, has a particularly wow. strange relationship to its own history, and and a, and a weird thing. You know, probably every place has a thing that is fetishized in history that shouldn't be right, and 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 a and a founding narrative that is wrong and that is you know erasure. Right? Like the, it, it, there, there's no place in the in the world really, but certainly in the West that that's not the case. And um, anyway, and so UVA is, you guys probably, you know, it's had a, it, a lot has happened. There was that Rolling Stone story about rape that was untrue. There was the white supremacist march on Charlottesville. Like there's, it's, it's, it sort of has felt to me like the sins of history were kind of bleeding out through the soil. You know, there was just, it was a place of extraordinary beauty and extraordinary violence. And while I was there, it was presented just as beauty. And, but you could feel that something was coming up because it always does, as we know it, it always does. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was the point where like, I remember my sophomore year, as they would call it, second year there, they, there were signs all over the school that said, Sally loves TJ, you know, like they're on Valentine's Day. And, and everyone thought it was cute, you know? And, and it, it feels very, like that wasn't that long ago, but it feels, you know, anyway, and I, um, and I, but I was also there on full scholarship, and um, you know, I've, I've written about UVA, like I've revisited that subject. It seems like a, in the way that any city could be, in any community, it can be a microcosm of the reckoning with history mm -hmm. that we're all in the middle of right now, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and and some, as I'm sure you've experienced, will say that this is an act of disloyalty, mm -hmm. right? Where in fact it's like this is this is the most loyal to it that I, this is this is to me what loyalty is mm -hmm. like. It's it is believing enough in a better version of it that I'm going to critique the version of it that is there right now. And I think about, you know, when you talk about the, what it, the role of the writer right now, I often think, um, I'm not saying like so much of, I fall short of this with most things I write. I, I often I'm just writing because that's my job and some things do. And, you know, I don't always get to the place where I'm, deeply uncomfortable and I'm puzzling through something that feels painful for some reason and that I'm afraid of in some way. Mm -hmm. But that's what, that's what anything that I've ever done that feels even vaguely worthwhile, and that's about as high as I would put it, that it has felt briefly vaguely worthwhile. Um, I think I've been thinking about that. Like what can I do in life and in writing that will, that will involve some element of risk and involve some element of prolonged discomfort and prolonged, um, you know, like what is a critique that actually has teeth that, that will, that's not the, that's not the easy, you know, that, that will be the opposite of like, you know, what, what is immediately coming to mind. I mean, one thing that I, this kind of goes back to something that we've been talking about over and over, but I often think to myself that like, I, I only think a piece of writing is bearable, like, or publishable or, you know, successful, you know, that not even, staking any claim on that is if I have been moved to a different place from when I started it than when I finished it you know like if if there has been like what's the point like I, I so much of what goes as so much of the writing that is published opinion writing right now it's like here's my position and here's why I think it right which is important in some I think there's absolutely like a role for that kind of writing there are some stands in which that is the kind of piece I would write this is what I think this is why I think it and at the end, this is what I think again. But in many cases, I feel like this is one of the ways in which writing and life, the purposes are twinned. It's like you have to move yourself forward in a piece. You have to you have to push yourself over a valley of uncertainty um, towards a place of like greater and more productive uncertainty. And you have to move yourself to some place in the end. Otherwise, what's the point? You're just you're just transcribing. You're just transcribing. And um, and. I think I'm I'm hoping I find the wherewithal and the courage to be to be in that place and write from that place, you know, more and more and continue to do that. And we were talking about how readers, you know, when you publish something and a reader comes back at you and you say and they say something like, You didn't take a stand on this position or you didn't immediately say it was bad or good or something and the the kind of like desire to um come to like pass judgment almost immediately in a piece of writing I think is really interesting where instead like the goal when I read you know your work is you're traveling through that process of uncertainty and like finding what 
the end point is, if there is an end point, right? And like, I was telling you, sometimes I want to have arguments with like the things that I'm writing because I'm trying to figure it out as well. And like, what does that mean to be in dialogue with a piece of writing that's asking you to be critical as well? And, you know, and I think that that is the most generous kind of writing is the kind that says this, you know, there may be something ambivalent, deeply ambivalent about this, or yes, I am going to reflect to you the world that is terrible so that you can decide in your own terms and refract it through your own point of view, the, the true terribleness of it, you know? Yeah, I think like, I think that it is, you know, as like, I know the reaction cycles, news cycles have been getting steadily more speedy for, you know, since like gramophone, right? Like it's not like what we're experiencing right now is is new, but it does sort of feel like how much worse can it get from here? How much quicker can we be expected to, des to decide um, what is happening? And especially because most of the, any, like any, now that social media is one of the major channels of political communication, news communication, it's structured around a reaction that will instantly signify good or bad, right? Like they're buttons, literally buttons. Um, that it's like, like worthy of amplifying for reasons of righteousness or anger or good or bad, right? Like it's it's just the 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 metrics of reaction have been locked into this extremely specific matrix of good, bad, righteous, angry, that um, really elide the reality of most situations and most human reactions. And I think as such, like it's it feels more important and also harder to try to slow down that reaction in myself, hopefully in the reader. I mean, and it's you know appropriate that we're talking about it here. Like art always asks the, the viewer to meet it halfway or more, right? Um, and increasingly, I think the expectation is that writing will kind of spoon feed you. Here's a screenshotable paragraph that you can send to someone and say like, this is why you're wrong, right? Like this is why this is why X, Y, Z is, is good or bad, should support it, shouldn't. And, um, and I think, that tendency is it's it's because the, the the mediums themselves are organized around them and it is yeah it, it becomes you know even in conversations it feels harder to resist those metrics of righteousness and superiority and good or bad and um and it, you know maybe it's another one of those ways that it like figuring out how to do it in writing reminds me also how to do it in life I think that's probably a good place to end. Um, I think we have a little bit of time for, I'm gonna say two questions. Okay, great. Two questions. Hi, um, I haven't read your book of essays, but I had a question and that is how, um, what I'm hearing is sort of clarity versus confusion, fact versus memory. And I'm just wondering how transcendence, which is something you were also talking about, plays into that process. And does that happen for you? Well, <laughs> transcendence is one of the things that I think about the most often without a clear understanding of why. I mean, I think that it is a quality that I'm looking for in, you know, at every level of life. I'm hoping at every second of the day I can transcend the version of me that is that fails constantly, that it's flawed, that's ungenerous, that you know, that is impatient, right? Like I'm I'm looking to transcend my own limits to to like to push past what has been given to a place of what could be. It feels like one of the fundamental projects of life, politics, writing, et cetera, right? Art, everything, everything. Emotional relationships with those we love, right? It's pushing past what is towards what could be. And I think as it relates to what you said, we've been talking about fact and memory. We've been talking about clarity and confusion. Fact and memory, I, I think maybe the where transcendence enters is if you can find, if you can find a synthesis of either of those two dyads that also feels true, right? That if if I can be clear, I mean, I thought about it, I, I, clarity and confusion, I think about it, if I can be clear about exactly why I'm confused, 
it will, it will lead me out of that confusion a little bit, right? And then lead me to a, gray, a place of even more nuanced confusion. And maybe, but maybe that's what it's all about, right? And the same with the fact and memory, the, the act of reconciliation of these two, uh, that these two things can often seem like opposites. When you realize that the back and forth, you know, between synthesis, whatever, thesis and antithesis can actually, like that, that process of going back and forth, that is also the version of transcendence when you are moving, uh, that is a place of moving towards something that was not visible before. Second question, okay, we got one back here. Hi, my name is Elena. Um, first, just wanted to thank you guys for your voices and what you do, the diversity you bring to, to this place and all the places you've been in and you will be. Um, I think the question that I have for you is how do you, what is your process for, and I'll have a little bit of context, but what is your process for practicing and balancing play and everything that comes with play, whatever that means to you, versus being such a knowledgeable person, which I think is a, a position that women are often putting themselves in, we have been put in, of like, caring and nurturing and sometimes policing and protecting and communicating and teaching and I think the more identities you hold away from cisgender, white, wealthy, lives on American soil, male, right? The more responsibility you might feel to do all those things. And so how do you manage all that, I guess? I mean, this is such a beautiful, wonderful question. Thank you for asking it. And I want to say, like, also, it is, again, as we were talking about the literary heroines, I think it is all of the alternative traditions that have situated joy and wildness and radical play at the center of what existing in and alongside all of those things can be, right? I think that, like, there, all of the... So uh, my personal answer to this is that um, you know we are born, we are forced to live as in a lot of ways as the person whose temperament, you know, we, we are the people we were since birth in a lot of ways, despite the fact that we are you know so shaped by all of these things. And I was born with a temperament that is deeply play focused. <laughs> that is like um, I am I'm I am so. I am so driven by sensation and pleasure and extremity um, that that needing to make space for things, those that has not been. It's um, it's almost like disciplining those like, <laughs> not disciplining that um, figuring out how that fits in. But I guess that's your question, and I think that um, how I think about that is that like undisciplinable, you know, that that fundamentally like wild. That is the quality that needs to be nurtured to break through categories and break through the received ideas. Like I, I think often, I mean maybe the best way for me to answer this is I, I feel very driven by instinct in every way. Um, it's one of the ways that I learned to trust my own brain is that I could go into a space and write down what I thought was interesting and then my, my instincts at the time they will have pointed me somewhere worthwhile, right? And I think, um, and, and that feels very physical, it feels very animal, it feels um, kind of beyond the realm of words, really. It feels like trusting something that is necessarily com almost anti-verbal. And that is the thing that has helped me, like retaining the knowledge that that, that drives everything is what has allowed me to inhabit those multiple identities in a way that feels consonant with the person that I am, that, um, that allows me to take care of and to try to be good and to try to, you know, you know that policing, right, to try to, um, th those places where you are kind of trying to draw lines and um, be careful, it's the, to me, it feels like you have to hang on to that drive towards wildness and experience just for the sake of it. Non, non surveilled, non monetizable, <laughs> non, you know, like utterly sort of useless, useless in the tradition, you know, in the, in the capitalist sense experience like that to me, like that is the, that is the wellspring from which anything else worthwhile could ever flow, even if those things get forced into those other, you know, categories and systems. Um, 
And I think that it is in like the traditions of the other in which that is foregrounded always first and foremost. And, and we should hang on to that.